Hello, it's Brand coming at you with another exciting Light of the Southwest right here at the GLC Studios. Very excited for tonight's show. You're going to see part one and part two, some very fascinating things. A lot of questions uh, many of you may be asking right now, but God is always the answer. Don't adjust your sets. It's not Clint Eastwood. It's not Sean Connery. <laughs> it's better than that. It's Jean-Claude Chavon. How you doing, Jean-Claude? Hey, I'm doing great, man. <laughs> Thank you. It's so Sean good to Connery. see you, man. <laughs> Now, people are used to seeing you, Jean-Claude, here at GLC with your yeah. older shows, but here you are. You're back. You haven't aged a bit. I, I know. Yeah. I feel like I haven't left. I know. And I, I like that goatee there, you man. You like that, though? Yeah. yeah. yeah that's pretty sharp there, you know. I, 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 now, was goatee a French thing? I think it is. Goatee. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. The, the name, yeah. you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. And, of course, you know, you're, uh -huh. you're dressed in black. And, of course. And every day is you're Johnny Cash. You're dressed in black, too. Well, well, of course it yeah. is, you know, but... As we got to, and we didn't organize that. Either. No, we didn't. It's a God thing. It's it's a God. Thing. It's a God thing. Yeah. Every day is Johnny Cash Day in the kingdom. I, I would like to declare, but <laughs> but on a serious note, you know, you know, as we got to see each other and reconnect, so good to see your face again. And I know I you. a lot yeah. of you are happy to see Jean Claude again as well. Yeah. You're going to see a lot more of him. But I was telling you a story in the car of a Bible college professor. He was dressed all in black, and he was in Seattle, and he was getting a a uh, soda pop, so they call it in the Midwest, but he, yeah. he was getting a Coke uh, at, at a filling station. And I guess the cashier thought he was a priest, and he's, he's right. a Christian church minister. <laughs> and he said, you know, don't, don't worry, Father, it, it's on the house. And he goes, oh, oh, bless you, my son. <laughs> and he walked out real quick. <laughs> but hey, you know, you know, there's power in wearing black. And, and uh, uh, they say black is a color of power, but we know what the ultimate power is, and that is Jesus Christ. That's Amen. Father God. That's it. And he's alive and he well on the earth. It. Amen. And you're right in the middle of it, brother. Yeah. You've been ministering in Nevada, in Las Vegas. Uh, of course, you're writing and speaking and uh, mm -hmm. a lifelong seeker. Welcome back, Jean-Claude. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. So give really us an update. What, what's happening back. with you right now? Well, well, really what the Lord is, is doing in me is really a culmination of my 40 years, 42 years of being a believer. It culminates into an accumulation of the various things he's taught me over the years, but contextualized in two avenues. One is the elect who are already in the kingdom. Right. And the other is the elect who have yet to come in the kingdom. Uh -huh. So that's fascinating. You, your two targets right now, the elect who are in the kingdom and the elect who aren't yet. That's right. They don't know it yet. Tell me about that. Well, it's simple to understand. I was one of these elect uh -huh. who didn't know that I was an elect, uh -huh. you see, because I was an atheist, like all good French people. Uh -huh. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, and one day I became an elect saved. So really, the, I have two messages, right. you see. And so it's really important to understand the difference between the two, from one side, the, the elect that have yet to be saved, those need to have a much greater understanding of what's going on mm -hmm. in the system, in the world, understanding the times today. Right. Because of the questions that are raised, thank God for the previous administration, which aimed, maybe unwillingly, I don't know, but it destabilized people's foundation about their trust in government and their trust in the press. So a lot of people are asking questions today and there are excellent answers to break down speculations and anything that opposes itself to the knowledge of God, you see. And on the other side, those elect who are yet in the kingdom, right. uh, who are already in the kingdom, I should say, those, uh, for those the message God has given me is how you, including me, how you can prepare the way of the Lord, because he's returning very soon. When, when I saw that the Lord gave us Biden mm -hmm. instead of giving us Trump for another four years, which I thought was going to happen, right. when I saw that God gave us Biden, then I knew that God gave the green light to what I called the really deep state, you got the deep state, but you got the really deep state. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, to give the momentum to usher in the final days. And it's critical to understand that because 
transformations are going to take place, more and more people are going to ask themselves questions, and believers in the Messiah, believers in Christ, need to be in, ready to give an answer to those who ask uh, them, to us, who ask us a reason for the hope that is in us. You see, it's getting more difficult for the world to deny that the Bible is true. Oh yeah. You know, evil is not fearing any consequence right now. Have you noticed that? Evil does not fear consequence. They do what they want to do, how they want to do it, when they want to do it. They don't care now that you know. And I believe that too, that Trump helped shine a light uh, to, to what's all, <laughs> always been there, you know. Uh, but we know that as time goes on, that the dark will become darker, the light will become lighter. We know who the light of the world is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about the parable that Jesus told about the workers, those who worked all day and those who came a little later on in the evening, but they both received uh, the reward that he had in store. Mm -hmm. And there's an awakening happening right now. There's a lot of people who perhaps didn't grow up in church. They didn't grow up uh, with, with a definitive <laughs> faith. And they are finding themselves being drawn to the light uh, because in this day and time, it is, it's almost like darkness has taken one side of the spectrum and all that is in it and all that is perverse and all that seems to be dark and all that seems to be destructive and all that seems to be evil. And the light seems to be gravitating towards the things that are more life and light uh, and, and, and productive. And yeah. so, folks, I tell you what, if you don't know Jesus, you need to come to the Lord right now. Uh, it's all unfolding right before your very eyes. Archaeology is always proving that the Bible has always been mm -hmm. true. Science, believe it or not, you know, you hear the term follow the science. Very weird science uh, going on here. Uh, but even scientists are, are, are verifying with, with things. Uh, history coming to pass, uh, even in archaeology and, and, and other discoverments as well. Elon Musk, of all people. Uh, I wouldn't classify him as a preacher <laughs> or necessarily as a Christian, but he is telling people now that we seem to be living in a, in a simulation, a grand simulation. Well, we know what that really is. We know that, that the book that we call the Bible has the beginning of the story and the end of the story. And your story is wrapped up in there. How it ends, I believe, is up to you. What you choose. You know, Jean-Claude, you had a quote earlier this evening, and, and I started writing some down because I have a feeling people will quote you uh, in coming days very, very soon. But one of them is you said, true love is the ultimate freedom. You've been a freedom seeker since you were young in France. Oh, yes. and, and, and atheism was the counterfeit of freedom to the truth. Why don't you exactly. expound on that? Because you have a heart for France. Mm -hmm. And France is key, I believe, just as you do in these end times. It is. It is because of its redemptive gift. See, it's, it's a really interesting uh, context about France. Um, being French, of course, I know the French heart. And I think God made me a pretty extreme type of a person. I like to push a, a logical statement at its conclusion to see where it reaches. So my favorite question is always, why, right? And <clears throat> as a kid, my passion was to be free. I want to be free. And I, I, was, I could tell so many stories, but I was passionate about being myself. And actually, the reason I chose the job that I did for so many years, I was a waiter for many years, because I could go work anywhere I wanted to, whenever I wanted to, there was always a job to be had somewhere. I even ended up working on a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. So my... <clears throat> my passion of being free, though, uh, I came to the conclusion that w the statement you just made, that in perfect love there is perfect freedom, because I thought I was free when I was an atheist, because I have nobody over me, just me, you see. I decide what I'm going to do with my life. In fact, my mom passed away a few years ago, but when I was a kid, I used to stand next to her. And in my mind, I never told her that, of course, but I would look at her and say, what do I have to do with this woman? Why do I have to be under her, subject, under her authority? Yeah. I have my own life to live. She has no right to tell me what to do. <laughs> That's how I thought. And right, I was right. a little kid, right? It started early. Yeah, I started early. And, uh, and 
I mean, my parents were good parents. I always got along with them. And they were, in such a way, they were watching over us, of course, like every parent would watch kids. And as soon as the sun would start going down, we had to come home. And the other kids could still play outside, you know, and it kind of bugged me because I want to stay out there and play again, right? And one day I asked her, I said, Mom, when I'm 18 years old, can I go out at night? Wrong answer. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, at age 14, I was out of my house. I found a way to make that happen so I could be by myself. So freedom has been something very important into my life. And I decided to become an atheist because it, the world didn't make any sense that there was a God. Because to me, God had to be absolutely perfect in every way, if there was one. And the world just didn't look like this. Because if I was him, I wouldn't allow this mess. Right. You see what I mean? So I thought, just like most people think, you know, if there is a God, he doesn't love us enough, or he's not powerful enough, can't do anything about it. Therefore, there is no God. And that was my just bottom line, simple logic for being right. an atheist. But as an atheist, you see, I'm free. Nobody is going to tell me what to do. It's my life, you see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so freedom was always a, a, a big part, still is, except now I have the perfect freedom in Christ, right? I didn't know that then. <laughs> I thought, I, you know, I made the, the, mistake, the same mistake people make in general. I equated religion with God, you see. Because you hear God and you see all these religions around and it's just a mess and they contradict each other and you don't know what to believe and who's right, who's wrong. And, and so to me, I didn't understand then that God is above all of this, right. you see. So <clears throat> I left God, I left religion, I left all of that and became an existentialist. It's even worse than an atheist. At least I knew what I believed as an atheist. Right, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the conclusions are, uh, I, I used to go on a website where atheists would go on to, to debate with Christians, right? Right, right. Years ago. And, uh, and uh, I went there and pretended to be an atheist. Ah. Oh, yeah. And you know what I did? I actually answered and said, made the statement that an atheist should make if he really believes what he believes, right? Right. And when I got through, I wrote, I forget how many, I still have it in my computer. When I got through, finished it, nobody ever answered anything else. I went back a week later, or two weeks later, or months later, because at the end of the paper, I said, you know what, guys, you need to wake up. Jesus Christ is real. He is Lord, Lord of all. Yes, he is. And he's alive. And you need to believe in him. But what I had done as an atheist was to express the conclusion that an atheist should come about, come to about life, Right. you see. And so it's really important. In Fra and France is by, by and large a uh, secular atheist, right. secular humanist country. Right. We call it laïcité in French. And they think it's great. Laïcité means, oh, we love everybody. Uh, I could tell you so much about that. <laughs> but you, you see, what is happening there is really, really important. Mm -hmm. And the French need to wake up because Islam is invading France, okay, big time. And they open borders, they come in as much as they want, they're favored by the, by the government, uh, and there's a lot to say about that. But the difference between secular humanism and a religion, quote unquote, namely Islam now, is that an Islamist has authority over him that he submits to, right. you see. So he, he has a purpose to accomplish because there is an authority that tells him what to do, okay? And he's, in his faith, he wants to abide by that. So he's driven by an ideology that causes him to behave a certain way and has purpose for his life. Secular humanism is nothing. 
Right. It's just an ideology of man that says, let's serve everybody. There is no authority over that except man, you see. And whoever is at the head is going to make the rule, and the one with the most uh, authority or the most power is going to rule. And it's, I forgot who said, I think it was William Penn. I think, it's, uh, I think it's William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania. Right. I, think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's him who said, if men will not be ruled by God, they will be ruled by tyrants. Mm -hmm. And you can't escape it. It's, it's a fact. And uh, there's so much to say about this, but it's critical to understand, especially for the French, because that's exactly what is happening in France right now. And they're being... Um, uh, they're growing into a dictatorship more and more and more. So there is much to say about this. But to go back to this freedom in Christ, in the greatest love, think about this. We, we were talking about this uh, during, during dinner, right? Uh -huh. <clears throat> True love engenders a profound confidence that enables one to rest in it. Because if you know somebody loves you, you don't fear them. They have nothing but the best intention to you. There is no reason for being afraid. And you trust them. That's exactly right. There is trust. You can have faith. You can rest. You don't have to fear. So true love eliminates complete, completely eliminates fear. That's why John says in the scriptures, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. The one who fears is not yet perfected in love, you see. And that's where the true freedom is. I didn't know that until I came to the Lord, until I came to the, the risen one. <laughs> Le ressuscité, we say in French. The risen savior when I came to him. Because God is perfect in every way. And he has nothing but good intentions for his children. So. Why should I fear? There is perfect peace, and there is perfect knowledge of his super wisdom, which beyond my comprehension, and his love beyond my comprehension, right. and his power beyond my comprehension. Passes all understanding. Yeah, and we're his kids. Those who belong <laughs> to him through Christ, we're his kids, he's my right. dad. You know, and, and that's, that's another, oh, so interesting. When I discovered, that in my life, I needed more of his love. I mean, I realized one day, that was over 20, over 20 years ago, I needed more and more of his love in my life, you know, because I realized how short I was. To me, it was like, you know, we'll have time to love each other when we get to heaven. Right now, there's a job to do, right, kind of a thing. But I, went, I was in a, in a prayer summit with a bunch of pastors in Minneapolis, St. Paul, way back in the 90s, late 90s. And I went to that prayer summit. It was a three-day prayer summit. And I went there with the intention that, Lord, I want more of your love. Because if I don't have it in me, how can I give it out? Right? Right. So I need more of his love. I want to love the way you love. I want to love people the way you love people. And I was expecting him to download in me. You know, this, I was expecting this download of love, push the button, Just come a love in, download. Boom, right. <laughs> but you know what? That's not what he did. You know what he did? What he, did? Oh, he said to me, son, before I'm your king, I'm your father. Wow. And I went, wow. And you know what he did? He gave me a picture. I mean, it was, so, it was a clear picture. And I saw, of all people, the king of England. It's a true, true story. You know, I see the king of England in my mind and on his bed in the morning. With, you know, what do you call those things? You know, the bed that have the four posts on each side and the top over? Canopy. What? Canopy bed, right. He, he had a canopy bed. And he's sleeping, right? <laughs> and the two kids, his two kids are coming up, you know, and jumping on the bed. And they're, daddy, daddy. <clears throat> and then, you know, and they wake him up and he's sleeping. And he's got his eye all there, you know. He puts his hand in, his, in their hair and he plays with them, you know. <clears throat> and obviously, he had just told me before, before I'm your king, I'm your father. father. That was great. 
Oh. And then the next picture, he gives, me, he gives me another picture. The picture disappears, and he gives me another picture. And here there is the King of England with all full apparel, decorations and the stripes and the sword on the side and the white gloves and the hat and, you know, and he's reviewing the troops in front of Buckingham Palace. Uh -huh. Okay. And as he passes by, everybody salutes, you know, everybody salutes and he salutes back. And as he walks down the aisle, the, 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 the side of these, of these soldiers, at the end of the line, there are his two kids. And they're all dressed up. The military uniform, the little hat and the glove and the thing, and, uh, you know. And as he passes by, they salute him. And he salutes them back. And the Lord says again, before I'm your king, I'm your father. It is. just blew my mind. Because that's the kind of relationship, I should say the kind of fellowship that God desires with us. It's all about love. It's all about him wanting more and more of the love, his love inside of us so we could share it with people. If we loved people the way God loves, oh. can you imagine? God is love. <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and you know, I wanted to go there, Jean Claude, because so many people have seen your shows on GLC, and God has given you genius. He's given you brilliance in, in, in your pursuit of freedom, your pursuit of logic, and to be able to communicate that to to a world that is desperate for answers. But I wanted to go there into your story uh, because you weren't like other children. You always had a, you always had the question, why, 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 and we're going to get to that. As we go along, you're going to want to share this show and shows with your friends, people. Uh, a lot of your neighbors are asking questions. They don't know where to turn. They have questions. Why is there evil in the world? What is God doing if there is a God? What, what, is, what is this world coming to? What is the agenda? If there is evil, what is its agenda? We're going to get to all of that. And in this, what you're watching right now is positive, true media, uncensored, unchained, unashamed. Uh, Kyle, could you put that? A graphic on the screen. Folks, I want to encourage you to get behind GLC right now. You know, Jean-Claude and I are here voluntarily because we believe in this, as is Kyle, as is Jarrett. Raindrop supporters are $1 to $30 a month. That's one day of junk food, folks. Uh, you spend twice that on a nice lunch or dinner. Water bearer, $30 to $75 a month. Operations, $70 to $150. Growth, $150 or more. Folks, I'm going to ask you to bypass all that. Uh, as I have, as many have. And you know what you did when you did that? Uh, all over, from Amarillo to uh, parts of New Mexico and, and beyond, so many of you on the first call to action, you, you jumped you jumped in line, you held the line. And then the next time we did a taping, we saw that you began to take the ground, to take the territory. You know, that, that command to take dominion never went away. We are to take dominion. You know, uh, uh, God is our father and children imitate their father. And our father told us to take dominion, to be fruitful. And so that command never went away. Take dominion with us. Let us, let us take back the, this, this territory. You know, Lucifer is the prince of the air. The media is why America is where it is right now. This proposed uh, race war that they want so they can bring in China, this communist Marxist ideology that you are now seeing in all uh, big tech social media and all the networks. You're not seeing it here because I believe there's coming a time very soon where you're wa what you're watching right now may be the only censor free, true news, true truth network in West Texas and beyond. So go to glc.us.com today and give your tax deductible gift. Get behind what God is doing. Find out what he's doing and get behind it. Help us create positive media because we're on the front line fighting the prince of the air. But we know who the king of the air is, Jean-Claude. And so back to your story. You've always been a seeker of truth. You've always been a, a seeker of freedom. And you talked about atheism. You know, I, when I believe this, in, 21 years ago, I was an adjunct professor teaching world religions and philosophy in Tulsa. And I had a young lady, she was Jewish and she was an atheist. Hmm. But she came to the knowledge of the truth. She came to Jesus. She became one of my best 
singers and the worship team at that wow. time. You know, but it's interesting how people respond to love. A lot of you watching right now, you tend to judge God by your father. If your father was aloof, God is aloof. If your father perhaps abandoned you or you felt that he had, God wasn't there for you. If your father was a good father, you tend to view God more that way too. I noticed that with the students. That, and I also noticed in, in that Marxist uh, institution, the professors who knew nobody, who did nothing, who accomplished nothing, but bullying kids, uh, they were determined to rid these kids of their faith. And they were successful. But when they encounter love, true love, as you said, Jean-Claude, true love, the ultimate freedom. They came to a knowledge of the truth, and they met their heavenly Father. And back to you, brother, you, you began to engage God as your Father and then your King. And what, what happened next? Yes, it's, and it's a struggle. I must say it's a struggle because it's, my nature is, we got to do some work here. And it's hard for me to... Uh, to focus and being mushy, if you will, you know, in that sense, right? <laughs> but, but I'm doing I'm doing a whole lot better with that, of course, you know. But one one thing one you mentioned earlier, it seems like darkness is increasing and light also, and it become more and more apparent because we see that in the last verses of the book of, of Revelation, let him who is filthy be filthy still, let him who is holy. Be holy still, let him who is unrighteous be unrighteous still, let him be who is righteous. Be, so we're seeing a polarization that's taking place between good and evil. And God is allowing this. Why? Because those who are on the fence today, who do not ask themselves questions, will be forced to choose one way or another. Because there will be no room for gray areas in the no, future. No, you can't ride the fence in this There day. will no longer be room for gray area. And the Lord will be certain to demonstrate through the church to the principalities and powers his manifold wisdom. Remember, he's demonstrating that according to the scriptures. Right. To the principalities and powers. He says, see what my wife is doing? Kick your butt. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway... <laughs> Well, I'm talking about the enemy. I'm talking about the enemy. <laughs> well, a veil has been lifted, and people are seeing good and evil very clearly. It's not hard to see it anymore, folks. Uh, I really believe that, that with the lifting of this veil, it's becoming clear, yes, there is a war between the light and the darkness. What's God up to? Which brings us to this next point. And, and, and you put it in a way I haven't heard before, but it, it rings true with my really? spirit. But, but God's agenda, uh, in your opinion, and I, I, I believe it too, are four main things. Yes. And the enemy has his four main things. Absolutely. And man has his four main points <laughs> uh, that he's trying to accomplish. All three of them uh, seem to be at war with each other. If someone asked you, what is God doing in all of this? What would you say to those elite who are in the kingdom who are asking what is God's agenda right now? Who is asking? The elite who already know him. What's God's agenda? What's he doing? Oh, well, there are four priorities. Uh -huh. I, I cannot think of four greater priorities that God has. Maybe some of you do have those priorities, know better. But here is the four priorities I believe God has today, always had, but more and more today nowadays. Number one. God wants all of humanity to know that he, the God of Israel, is the God of creation, the one only true God. Number two, God wants all of humanity to know that his son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Mashiach, is the savior of the world to the Jew first. Priority number three, he wants those who belong to him, you and I, if you are one of those who belong to the Lord through the Messiah, through Jesus Christ, he wants you and I to grow in the fullness of the maturity that he has prophesied in the book of Ephesians. The fullness of the maturity that belongs to the Messiah. And number four, he wants to see souls saved. Those, I believe, are the four priorities 
that God has. And everything he has designed in the scripture aims towards fulfilling these four priorities that he has. And therefore, anything that would detract from, fooling the, from fulfilling this cannot be of God. Because Satan has four priorities. Mm -hmm. He does not want humanity to know that the God of Israel is the God of creation. And he has strategies to that end. He does not want humanity to know that Yeshua is the savior of the world. To the Jew first, and he has strategies for that as well. Number three, he does not want to see the church, the believers who belong to him, grow in the maturity of the fullness. Why do you think we have so many divisions around? And number four, he does not want to see souls saved, you see. So th those, are really, those are really, really important considerations to study, uh, to study because the theology that God has revealed in the scripture from Genesis to Revelation aims to fulfill this. And so you ask what, what is he doing in the world today? I believe that God's priority today for us is for us to grow more and more in the knowledge of the Messiah. Right. He is preparing the way of his return. And when, <clears throat> when we say preparing the way of the Lord, what do we mean by that? Well, to me, at least, it's, it's all about me. It's all about you. It's all about individuals preparing their lives to receive the Messiah coming back. It's like you're waiting for a guest to come to your home. What do you do? Leave the house early? What do you do? <laughs> Put your bad clothes on? No, you clean up yourself. He's coming back for a, pri for, a for pure church. What does that mean? It means, according to Ephesians 4, we are no longer swayed by every wind of doctrine. We all come to the unity of the faith. What faith is that? The faith that was once given to the saints. Jude 3, you see. And, and notice the words. The faith that was once given to the saints. And the words just before those words are contained earnestly for the faith that was once given to the saints. So there is a lot to cover and understand about that because it's not the faith that would be later on given to the saints, the Catholic faith and the Protestant faith and the Orthodox faith and all the babies they have. No, we have to go back into the shoes of the disciples after the resurrection and look at the scriptures the way they looked at the scriptures. Because the only scriptures they had was the Tanakh, what we call falsely the Old Testament. They didn't have a New Testament, they had the words of the Messiah for right, sure. Right. Plus the best Bible study, because after he rose from the dead, it went through the scriptures, the Psalms and the prophets, and that was the best Bible study in the world, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he showed them where he was prophesied, you see. And so, <clears throat> we very, very, very seriously must slice off 2,000 years of history, of Christian history, and go back in the shoes of the disciples after the resurrection and understand the scriptures the way they did. Because when Paul said, all scriptures is inspired by God, available right. for reproof, for teaching, and so on and so forth, he didn't know that when he wrote this, it was going to become scriptures, right. obviously. So he was referring to the Old Testament, so-called. Okay, and there's a lot of verses in the, in the New Covenant, in the, in the New Testament, that refer to the Word of God. Right. Uh, and so we have made, um, I've made the mistake for 20 years of my life, looking at the New Covenant. And the old was kind of, you know, until the Lord said to me, Jean-Claude, I want you to study how the church is supposed to operate according to the scriptures. And that was 21 years ago. And, and, he, and also he told me, the first thing he told me 20 years ago, I want you to come closer to me. Number two, I want you to study, the script, uh, to study how the church is supposed to operate according to the scriptures. And in those days I thought New Testament only, of course. And number three, I want you to understand the times. And I didn't, know, didn't quite know what that meant, but that launched me onto a, a study which now has culminated into these two messages, one for the elect that have yet to be saved, 
in which we talk about the time, we talk about politics and finance and economy and religion and all these topics which are all interrelated. Sure. And on the other side, for the elect that are saved, we talk about how to prepare the way of the Lord. And I finished um, on the radio in, uh, in Las Vegas. I finished uh, 71 30 minute programs on that topic alone. So there's a lot of material uh, <clears throat> to cover, of course, you know, it's a, it, it, Well, you just need to so cover much. it here on GLC. Huh? You just need to cover it here on GLC. Yeah, yeah. We can you know, we need to do that. You know, you talked about God's four priorities that, that I agree. And the enemy's four priorities, which is always uh, anti-God's agenda. Oh, yeah. It's always a counterfeit. That's what he does. But you also mentioned four priorities that you see men in their foolishness that they believe is wisdom <laughs> well, <laughs> are trying to accomplish. I didn't identify four for men. I haven't thought about doing that. I will. Okay. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, Satan, God, and man. Those are the, th the three entity, spiritual entities that animate humanity. Okay? I like how you say that, animate humanity. That's, that's how it is, okay? And, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really important to understand that because unless we understand the spiritual context of humanity, we cannot really make sense of what is happening in the world today. We can't. It's just a fact. And it, uh, the... What is happening in the world today is just a big question mark. Why? You know, and my favorite question being why. So <clears throat> I, I should say God, Satan, and man have the same goal. There you go. They have the same goal. You see, God wants everyone to come under him through the, through the Lord Jesus Christ by his love. Right? Right. Satan wants everyone to come under him through fear. Right? Right. And of course, he's using his lamb for that big time. And in number three, man wants everyone to come under him through his deceit and his manipulation and his political correctness and the, all of that stuff that's going on in the, the world house today. House of cards, it is falling apart oh. right now. And you know what's so good about this? <laughs> Psalms 2. God is looking at this and he says, why do the nation rage? <laughs> Why do they, you know, and he sits in the heavens and he laughs. Because man is so foolish in his foolishness, right. wanting to be God, if you will. Well, a fool in his heart says there is no God. Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't make very good gods. We don't, no, we don't, <laughs> we, we don't. We, we, we fail, you know. But it, it is amazing to see the, uh, the diligence with which man actually pursues his ideal, you know, <clears throat> it's it, to me, I, I always ask myself questions, right? Always why, you know, why all of this is happening? Well, my best explanation is this. Okay, President Trump always talked about the deep state, which we all know exists. I believe there is also the really deep state, okay? <clears throat> um, the which is... Uh -huh. Principalities and powers, perhaps. The principalities and powers are animating all of this, okay? But they, because the world is under the dominion of Satan, according to 2 Corinthians 4, is the God of this world, right? And so, but from, from an atheistic, secular humanist perspective, and I, I go back to my days as a kid, The satanic ideology, the satanic spirit that resides in people will affect their lives depending on the actual level of ability to lead that God has given. Okay? God gives ability to lead. There are two kinds of people in the world uh, in this context, leaders and followers. Okay? So it's really important to understand. Uh, I use as an illustration um, the fact that those different ideologies, I should, I should begin here. First, there is the reality of things. Okay? We see businesses, we see government buildings, we see banks, we see uh, ins institutions, schools, we see homes, we see 
roads and streets, and we see the reality of things. Okay? All of this reality is animated by ideologies. Okay? And we'll come back to that. And then all of these ideologies are animated by the spiritual context of humanity. Okay? So you have those three levels of things. The majority of people who are followers, and that's normal, it's about 80% of people uh, follow. You know, they're sheep with other, with other shepherds, like Jesus said. So most of human beings are like this, unless they've been gifted by the Lord to have a responsibility. Now, it's important to understand that responsibilities have different degrees in terms of their applicability for responsibility in terms of, of uh, governing. Okay. Uh, I'll take, uh, as an example, let's, let's take a small, I don't want to name business, so let's take a small uh, hamburger joint. Okay. Okay. So you have the manager of the hamburger joint, right? But then you have the manager of the hamburger joints for the city. Mm -hmm. And then you have a manager for the hamburger joints for the state. Right. And then you have a manager for the hamburger joint for the nation. Right. And then you have a manager for the hamburger joints for the world, same company. Well, each one of these people have different abilities to lead, but each one of them will be submitted to the one above them. Right. Because the ideology above has to be applicable below to fulfill the goal of the corporation. So people, therefore, have different perspective in their understanding of life. Um, the fellow who is, uh, and let's apply this to governments now, okay? You have a district superintendent, and then you have a mayor above, and then you have a governor, mm -hmm. and then you have um, a house representative, a congressman, and then you have a senator. And then you're a president, you see. And all these people have different ideologies which trickle down from the top. Now, the president is just another puppet on a string because the deep state actually uh, orchestrates what is going on in the nation, okay? And the laws that were written, which were supposed to actually protect people, are now protecting the, the, the evil. The laws, are, the laws are no longer just. No, and, and they don't follow them themselves. Yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, telling you another issue altogether, but it's a fact. So the way I illustrate this is that you have uh, the people that are in the forest, they don't see the forest for the trees for most people. Right. And then you have the one that's above that who's ruling and maybe in a Cessna, a little Cessna view. You know, you can see a little bit more. And then over the Cessna, you have the guy with the helicopter. He can go up and down, you know, up to 30,000 feet, maybe 20,000 feet, up and down. He can go different. And then above that, you have the passenger liner. He has a much greater view of what's going on, you see. And he understands things that the one below does not. But the one below has to line up with what he sees. And then above the passenger liner, you have the U-2 plane at 80,000 feet. Right. Yeah. And above the U-2 plane, what do you have? You have the space station. That's right. Now, this is where the really deep state resides in the space station. Now, they see, and I have pictures in my computer with all of that. You know, it's really interesting to look. So you have the really deep state that looks at pretty much of the whole world. And their, their ideology is different than the one below. Okay. Now, there is a sliding scale. People who want to go from here to there, for sure. And they look for these people. But, so it's really important to understand that. Now, because of the scriptures and because the wisdom of God and because we belong to him and because of his word, we have the satellite view. <laughs> we go up 24,000 When we have miles. the mind of Christ. That's right. Instead of looking at the initial manifestation. That's right. Uh, instead, you know, and we tend to be distracted. Yeah. You know, the enemy is a master of distraction. So he wants us to focus on the initial manifestation, forgetting that there are ranks and yes. there are principalities and there are powers of yeah. evil in the heavenly realms. That's but right. We're so focused and distracted on the initial manifestation 
that we forget to have we the mind of Christ and to have that satellite view. Yeah, we need that satellite view 100%. Because now, you see, what we have to understand is what, is these, what are these ideologies and why is there such pressure to accomplish these things? Well, here is what I believe, okay? Um, just, you know, you can accept me or accept it or not, but here is what I believe. I believe that the people that are at the helm way above in this really deep state, I think these people have a vision for the world. They, they consider themselves the saviors of the world, okay? And they want to see a world where there is no more wars, there is no more famine, there is no more inequality among nations, with rich, nations that are super rich and some that are starving to death. There is, they want to see a world where there is no more destruction of ecology. That, that's part of their vision for the world. Now, uh, ultimately, but in order for that to happen, they must control everything in the world. They must, well, they must bring chaos and then reorganize in their, yeah. in their new image. You know, the, the phoenix, which is a very powerful symbol. People don't realize uh, how common it is. But order out of chaos. That's exactly correct. But they first must create the chaos. Just That's like right. communist governments do. My friend Bob Fu, who experienced torture at the hands of the communist uh, government, Chinese communist government, who has a lot of our media, has a lot of our leadership in, in D.C. You know, you must crash the system, destroy the system with, with uh, frivolous spending, and then blame capitalism, uh, declare a dictator, bring in socialism, disarm the people, and then bring a communist state. That's the same formula they've done every time, and it's failed. Mm -hmm. every time and now we're seeing the agenda of the elite being uncovered perhaps yeah. before they wanted it to be uncovered it's uh, i don't think they're ready yet for that very soon because they had a perfect opportunity last year with the covid they could easily have removed cash from circulation oh all. they could have look, look how didn't. willingly not, people gave yeah, up all their they're rights not, they're not ready yet for that but that's why we still have some time but anyway you know the the ideologies of these people um is good. Who doesn't want to see a world without, without wars and without famine and with, of course. But in order for that to happen, they, are, they, they must take many steps. And so the control that they're aiming at, the, the, the real division today is very simple to understand. The, the desire to eliminate the Judeo-Christian foundation of society is necessary from their perspective because that is what has brought autonomy in a nation. That's what has brought individualism, the ability of people to become what they can become, you see. And as long as you're going to have autonomy of nation, an individual that can pursue their life to become everything they can be, they cannot bring control. So what you have today is a, is a battle between individualism and collectivism, mm -hmm. you see and uh, a, a striving to eliminate autonomy of nation. That was, uh, that's why they were so much against Trump, but because of that, because it was all for the autonomy of the nation and all. And so there's a lot to understand about that, brother. But in, in an ideology, that's what they are after. And like you said, you know, they'll create the problem to bring the solution. It's called, it's, Hegelian dialectic, it's called. Exactly. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's right. For those of you who don't know what Hegelian dialectic is, really easy to understand. Uh, let's say I own a, a glass shop, you know, mirrors or windows shop, and I have no business, you know what I mean? I'm starving. So here is what happens. I'm going to hire a bunch of hoodlums, and I'm going to have them break windows with stones all around the, all around the park. Guess what? I'm going to get calls for business, you see. So the desired result is me having business. The means to make it happen is to create some problems for the people Almost that are going to Almost a plan obsolescence, me. isn't it? That's what it is. That, it, they do that all the time, you know. And so it, it's, um, it's a, we're living in, a, in a, a fallen world. And I tell you what, the, ultimately, okay, if these people, these elite, were to succeed to bring about the world they want. You'd have two classes. You have a feudal state and you have the rich and the poor, That's which right. have today more and more. And it's never going to happen because, you know, we read the end of the book and we know who wins, right? right. So it's not going to happen. But the, um, the, the reason that they, they
cannot make it happen is simple. I did a comparison between the four socioeconomic systems that exist in the world to the socioeconomic system that exists in the scriptures, because there is one. And I, I forgot, I think I have six slides or something of, of, of the four, and the four socioeconomic system. You have communism, you have capitalism, you have fascism, and you have socialism. Those are the four socioeconomic system. Even capitalism is no good in the end because of the nature of man. It's good on a temporal basis for individuals, but ultimately the nature of man is I want more, 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 right. more. We're never satisfied. It's never enough. So when you look at all the down, downside of these systems, right, and I think I have six slides of one-liners describing those downside of the socioeconomic system the world has, and they, they cannot get out of it because that's what they're stuck with. Right. But God's socioeconomic system in the scriptures is the best. And that is what's going to be implemented in the kingdom. Oh yes, of his government and peace and the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Forevermore. And I tell you what, in the kingdom, individuals will become everything they can be and so will nations. Because the law will go out of Jerusalem, the world from Jerusalem and the law out of Zion, you see. And so the... Now then, I have one slide with the title, um, what are the downsides of God's social economic system? So I get a big black slide, right? And in the center of that slide, there is a teeny little point of light, right? And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it turns out to be a big zero. <laughs> this system is perfect. Yes. Absolutely perfect. So what I'm saying is, the, the, the people in the world, even some of these leaders, which I'm really after leaders on both sides of the elect, I'm really after leaders, because there are a lot of these leaders, I believe, who have good intentions, but as they rise in the hierarchy mm -hmm. of responsibilities, they discover how evil the system is. And sometimes they discover that a little late. They discover late sometimes, yeah, and some decide to stay and some decide to get out. And that's how we can have some really interesting uh, insights as to what is going on behind the scenes. Well, see. as we're beginning to transition into uh, the second part of this, which we'll be talking about how to prepare the way. Yes. Uh, what, what are you doing? What am I doing? What can we do? Uh, how can we get on God's program, which is for no man to perish, but for every man to come to the knowledge of the truth? The answers are coming up, folks. Now, if you would, Kyle, would you show that graphic on the screen again? Folks, get behind positive media. Get behind true news. Get behind uncensored information. Uh, uh, right there, raindrop supporters. Uh, hey, you know what? Lose weight and help GLC. <laughs> you know, skip the junk food for one day a month or, or uh, do three days a week. Water bearer, uh, that's 30 to 75 a month. <coughs> Operations, uh, 75 to 150. Or growth, 150 or more per month and of course you're not limited by that but every little bit counts but folks you're doing it uh, uh this is not sowing seed into a sinking ship uh this is sowing seed into something that's moving and it is alive uh, ground is being gained momentum has increased and you can be a part of that you know we used an illustration before you know moses his mother uh, uh put him in a basket and, and directed him towards the palace where he knew <laughs> He would flourish. Well, you know what? The same is, is the same thing with your buying power and with your money. You can put your seed in a place where it will flourish and it will come back and it can deliver you. So we're a part of all this together, folks. Whatever level you are, uh, we're so grateful for you getting behind. And I'm there with you. Jean-Claude is there with you. Uh, the great crew here tonight is is here with him. So grateful for Kyle directing this and, and Jared, you know, uh, the stage hand, uh, stage manager uh, and, and running cameras and, and all that. We're in this together. And so I am so thrilled uh, to be right here. And now Jean-Claude, you know, you and I were talking well, when I got you at the airport and, and I know how much you love uh, God's people. I know how much you love America. I know the heart you have for France and how serious these times are to you. Mm -hmm. This is a reality to you. Absolutely. This is a reality to me. Jesus is a reality. And when he is your reality, when he is your rock, 
You can walk fearless during these times. I personally think that we've asked to be here during this time. But Jean-Claude, I'm excited to be here right now. That warriors are meant for the battle. We fight not against flesh and blood, but we fight. And we're in the fight. Stand with us and stand with GLC on the front line, fighting the prince of the year with the truth, with positive media and true media, giving truth to the nations, all the platforms that you, you can experience GLC. You know, Jared, they can go to youtube.com and see a live stream. You can also watch on demand. Uh, be sure and type in Jean-Claude Javon on YouTube. You've got a lot of stuff out there. Uh, you're I don't about think to, so. uh, you know, but you know, your lessons, you know, e even the, the older lessons, you know what you're preaching the timeless word, yeah. the word of God is new. It is alive. It is living and it is active and it's sharper than any double edged sword. It's quick, right? Yeah. It is still relevant because it is the truth. Be a part of sharing the truth today. Go to glc.us.com and get involved today. Uh, get in the fight with us. And in part two with Jean-Claude Javon, we're going to talk about preparing the way yes. in a fresh way. You know, children imitate their father. And you will either see people whose agenda is to steal, kill, and destroy, or to lift up and unite and build up. Guess which team you're on. If, if you walk in his love and you walk in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship with, with one another, we are building each other up with knowledge, with love, with prayer, and with resources. So, Jean-Claude, as we're transitioning into part two, uh, is it possible that we can help prepare the way, just Absolutely. as John the Baptist did? Absolutely. We'll talk about that in the next session. Absolutely, <laughs> just as John the Baptist did. Good introduction into it. Hey, thank you very much. Yes. You, you know what? There's also people, you know, you're desperate for answers and you're asking questions and, and there is a lot of fear out there, but perfect love cast out all fear. I'm going to make a meme of you that says true love is the ultimate freedom. That's absolutely because right. It, it, because it is true. Uh, you know, this ne next section that you're going to see uh, when you watch it, why, why is there evil in the world and how can we prepare the way for God, there's so many great things. You have so many books in you, Jean-Claude. And I'll tell you, when you're interviewing a man like this, uh, uh, if you have people in your family that they have a different personality type, they're analytical thinkers, they ask why. There's nothing wrong with asking a question, is there, Jared? You know, you know if, if, if anyone is offended of you asking a question, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. But for those who are confident, who are, uh, who are assured of their faith and they know the truth and it's a reality to them, you can ask whatever question you want. Some of you are asking questions right now. What do I do next? How do I survive? How do I navigate this reality? Well, you don't have to navigate it alone. And every time that you watch GLC, I hope that there's a chance where you, you can say, you know what? Lord, I tried everything that, that I know to do. I don't know what to do now. Uh, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm confused. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I never believed in this God thing. And now I see history unfolding. And I guess this Bible is right after all. And I haven't always walked with you, Lord, and, but can you take my life? Can you use me? Can you use me and come into my life, Jesus? It's not just a prayer, folks. It's a lifestyle. Prayer is one small part of that, uh, dipping your toe in the water. But you know what? I want you to use me, Jesus. I've gone as far as I can. I've gone nowhere. Some of you, you've gone to the top of the mountain, and you saw there was nothing there because it was all a lie of what this world says bring happiness. It didn't bring you happiness. It just brought you more of a burden, more confusion. But in him, there is perfect peace. There's no confusion. And so be encouraged to stop your world, to see where you are, to own where you are, and to say, Jesus, I want to start here. Come into my life. Live in me. Be my Lord and Savior. Teach me your ways and help me prepare the way for your return in Jesus' name. Folks, thanks for joining us for Light of the Southwest. Be sure and catch part two with Jean-Claude Chavon. We'll see you soon on Light of the Southwest. Hello, welcome back to Light of the Southwest. This is Brand coming at you with Jean-Claude Chavon, part two. And we're talking about some great things. It's always good to see you, Jean-Claude. Good to see you now, as now, well. Oh, no, we broke out good the glasses be because we, 
we may talk about some serious things, you know, that, that at a certain points in the show will we'll, you we know, may, we you know, may we'll, just we'll uh, inter interject that, you know. But, you know, you are a thinker and you are a seeker. And, folks, <laughs> uh, those people in your family uh, around the holidays that, that like to question everything, guess what? It's okay. And yes. show them this show. Show them these two shows with Jean-Claude Chavon. Uh, so glad to have you back, brother. I'm so glad to be back. And as we prepare for this final showdown, which is one of the things that you talk about, he's a writer, he's a minister, a speaker, a lifetime seeker. What do you teach and what is your final authority? Let's start off with ah. that. I already know, but ah. tell the folks at home there. What do I teach? What do you teach, Jean? Why do I teach? What do I, why do I teach Who what is I teach? Who Jean Claude? Yeah. What does he teach? You know, uh, why, why do I teach what I teach? Why do you do it? It's because there's people out there that are going to end up in hell or in heaven. And I'm concerned for their souls because they need to hear the truth. And those who are of the truth, they will hear and respond. And that's really the reason what why I teach what I teach. God has put that in me to do that. Because of love. Because of his love for them. And uh, he sent his son into the world to die for them. Greater love. And you know what's interesting? The Lord said, greater love no man has than he gave his life for his friends. But there is a greater love than that. Okay. Yes. He did it. While we were enemies, he died for us. While we were yet sinners. So we there enemies. is a greater love to die for the enemy. And those who are under persecution are willingly laying down their lives for the sake of the soul that's in front of them. Just like David Wilkerson, remember that story in uh, The Cross and the Switchblade? He, were, he had this fellow that was in front of him, that was a knife, and they were going, he was going after David Wilkerson, and David Wilkerson, you know what? Even if you cut me into little pieces on the sidewalk, every piece will cry out that Jesus loves you. Wow. And that's what touched the guy, uh, Nicky Cruz. Right. You see. Played by Eric Estrada. Which one? Yeah. You're going to see on GLC sometime. Who's, really? serve, who's serving the Lord now. Excellent. But back, back so, to there. But that's part of the power of that. You see, the, the power of willing, willingness to die for the enemy. That's the love of God. Wow. You see, no man has greater love. You know, you're going to die for your friends, you know, but you're not going to die for the enemy. The mafioso on the street corner is not going to die for the other guy that's in the other camp. You see what I mean? So there is a greater love, and that's the kind of love God wants us to have inside of us. I'm so, so glad. Huh? I'm so glad. That's, a, that's the one. That, that's, that's, what he, that's what there is to grow inside of us. Well, think about this. I mean, a, a, a finite being cannot repay an infinite debt. No, of we talked not. about that. Only an infinite being yeah. can repay an infinite debt. Yeah. And so this infinite being and this finite being of this debt of darkness and sin, he stepped in front of himself yeah. and took the punishment. Can you imagine? For us. You know, of all the religions of the world, brother. That's the only one. Only one is not based on what you do, but based on what's been done for you. That's right. But when you know him, you will do the works yes. of the Father because Out you of love. love him. Out of and love. And y'all know that yeah. you love the Lord, brother. Out of love. Yeah. Now, final authority. I was so disturbed when I was a kid because at one time, I was so convinced that I was right. I mean, you couldn't have shaked me and said what I believe was wrong, only to find out later that I was wrong. And as a kid, it really affected me deeply because I realized that moment that I couldn't trust my own thinking. And it brought me in front of a really disturbing thought because how could I ever know that I'm right about what I think? Right. So I purposed, uh, I, I realized that emotions were a great part. We were talking about emotions the last one. I didn't like emotions. I don't want emotions. I'm going to be cold as a cucumber, like they say. So I didn't want emotions to affect my, my ability it to think. It wasn't logical. Uh, that's right. You, you, you it were like the French be. Spock. 
so to speak. René Descartes. <laughs> René Descartes. No, yeah. René Descartes. Some of our famous philosophers in France have greatly affected the world. Right. But anyway, and I thought, okay, I can't even trust myself. You know. <laughs> right. And so I had to become very logical because now I have to be able to analyze the best I can because opinions can't be depended upon. Claims are not fact. Um, so I said, how do we know? And so a few years ago, I had a, a messianic rabbi ask me to write an article for his paper. And I said, what do you want me to write about? And he said, write about God. That's oh, okay. okay. That's kind of a broad. All right. So <laughs> I write about God. So I'm getting out. I'm getting my car. And I'm going. And I'm saying, wait a minute now. Nobody can write about God. Nobody. We can't see him. We can't touch him. We can't hear him. We can't feel him. We can't smell him. He's out there somewhere, and we're down here, and our mind is just messed up. Our conclusions could be wrong, even though we think we're right. Nobody can write about God. In that sense, what you think about God is just as good as what I think about God. And so nobody can write about God. And I thought, you know what? The only way we can write about God, if that creator took time to transcend time and space and revealed himself into his creation right. and left some intangible, undeniable proof of his existence, right. which is what he did. The God of the Bible is the only God. Okay? Right. He's the one only true God, the God of the Bible. is the God of creation, the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He is the one only God. So only then can we write about God, you see. And so what is the book that talks about him? The Bible. So final authority is the Bible. If I have a discussion about issues, the doctrine and all, don't bring me somebody's book, okay? I want to know how you came to the conclusion of what you teach based on your own study of the scriptures because that is the final authority. I am not the final authority. A pastor is not my final authority. A denomination is not my final authority. A religion is not, nobody's final authority except the scriptures that God has seen fit to translate in, in whole or in part in 2,500 languages. There's no book like it in the world. It's humanly impossible. So that is my final authority, is the scriptures, you see. and. It, it's a little bit like the dictionary. We can argue back and forth how to spell a world, a word, you know. But bottom line, what we'll do, we'll open the dictionary and say, see, you were wrong. Oh, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, I was wrong, you know. And so it's the same with the scriptures. So that is my final authority. I'm glad to hear that. Because we get into dangerous things when our emotion is our final authority. Mm -hmm. Our opinions uh, being our final authority. What you think one day is right and the next day you think is wrong. Uh, the Bible is that truth. Mm -hmm. It is true. It is the words of life. He is the word. It divides. You, you know, you make a decision. You know that song, I decided to follow Jesus. The word decision literally means to, to cut, to decide. You know, have you decided, have you decided to follow Jesus? Have, have you decided to take his life map uh, for your life? It works. You know, the Bible works. Even for those who aren't deep thinkers, the Bible works. His context of marriage, it works. His, his context of raising children, it works. His context of, of leadership, it works. The Bible mm -hmm. is even pragmatic. It works. And it's true. And... Uh, and the gospel yet is so simple. You know, you talked about writing about God and how he entered into his creation. You know, never forget hearing how missionaries sometimes describe the gospel. You want to hear it real quick? I know sure, you do, Jean-Claude. Go, go, go. <laughs> go, go, oh, go. It is that a father and his son was walking into a forest that recently had caught fire. It was, it was just burned down. And a little boy noticed 
uh, from a little distance a, a burning log and he got closer and he saw all these ants running in circles on the top of this log that was beginning to go up in flames and the boy was distressed. So he grabbed a stick and he tried to make a bridge, you know, uh, from the log to a rock so that all these ants could escape this inferno, this, this impending doom, right? But he began to cry because he noticed that they weren't seeing the bridge. They weren't going there. They weren't, they weren't listening, so to speak. He even noticed some had little, little babies on their backs. And the boy became distressed. And he said, Father, Father, how can I tell them? And the father answered, Son, in order to tell them, you have to become an ant. Oh, yes. And that's what he did. He became one of us. He yes. entered into his creation. He had the whole thing planned out. Amen. He gave us free will. We talked about that. Fascinating how you talk about it. It all comes down to love, which is why you do what you do. And mm -hmm. his word, which is your final authority from mm -hmm. him. I'm so glad that that's how you operate, Jean-Claude. Yeah. Because even for those who they don't think with their heart first, it needs to be logical. It needs to make sense. There needs to be a standard. It needs to be proven, right? Some of you... Uh, believe yourselves to be scientists. What is science? It's what can be observed, mm -hmm. right? But that word is more powerful and it's timeless and it's humanly impossible to exist the way that it does, written over the time span that it did on different continents, saying the same thing and the scarlet thread of the Messiah throughout the scriptures. The Bible is true. A lot of you are saying that. So for the elect that already know the Lord, that you speak into their hearts. What about the elect that haven't come to him yet? And they're saying, okay, so you teach because you love us. And the word, the timeless, proven by history, proven by precept, proven by pragmatics, <laughs> proven in how it works. What do you have to say to me? Why? You told me why you do it. Why should we choose God? That's a very good question, my brother, because the, end, the real answer is demonstrated in our life, the, li the kind of life we live, you see. What they observe our life to be is going to speak more than our words ever will. And so the preparing the way of the Lord is an incredibly important thing to understand because as Yeshua said, as Jesus said in John 17, we are all going to become one in him. Yeah. And they will know us when we have the love for one another. That's in John 13, but that we be one as you father are in me, that they be one in us, that the world may know that you have sent me. So there is an ingredient in addition to love that is critical, and that is a life of righteousness. Because there will be unity in the body of Christ based on love, but it is not going to be at the expense of righteousness or truth. So these ingredients are critical. And so within the church today, within some of these who are already elect, they're looking at unity in terms of gathering all of the believers together and leaving doctrine aside just so we love each other. That is not unity of the spirit. That is a spirit of unity. There's a difference between the two. Wow. I've never, say that again. I've never heard that before. There is a difference between a spirit of unity and the unity of the spirit. Wow. And that is really important to understand. Because, and I'll tell you the difference. A spirit of unity is necessary for functioning together. Let's say we're going to do a, an evangelistic outreach. Right. Or a citywide prayer movement. Well, all of the denominations come to work together for that particular issue. Right? In order to do that, they must leave aside doctrine. 
Otherwise, if they had to wait until they all get together, doctrinally speaking, to work together, it would never happen. So a spirit of unity brings the people together at the expense of truth and righteousness. Wow. Unity of the spirit is altogether different. That is the spirit that the Lord is speaking of, that we all grow into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and to a mature man of the fullness of the maturity that belong to Christ. Okay. That's what we're supposed to come into. So we're looking at a maturity in him of each individual. A spirit of unity will bring, will call me to come closer to him in truth. Why? John chapter 4, when he spoke to the woman at Samaria, he said, uh, you do not know what you worship because salvation is of the Jews and the hour is coming and now is where the true worshipers will seek to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Okay. Now notice the words. The hour is coming and now is. So now is obviously you always have to seek truth. But why did he say the hour is coming? Why? You see, there is a dimension of seeking after truth that is required on the part of believers, which I believe is the calling for the preparation in the last days. Why? Because, and, and notice what he said, the other word that is important is the true worshipers. There's worshipers, and there are true worshipers, right. okay? Very important. Now, why did he say those who seek to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seek, seek such? Because truth, think about this. In John chapter 8, even those who are outside quote the verse all the time, they don't know it's out of the Bible, the truth will set you free, okay? You hear that all the time, even oh, yeah. in the unsaved, right? The <laughs> truth sets you free. They don't know where it comes from. It comes out of John chapter 8, verse right. 32. But they don't quote 31, which says, If you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, the 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 being set free by truth is required by having the final authority of his word. Now, if truth sets me free, think about this. If truth sets me free, then a lie needs to keep me in bondage somewhere. Uh, why is that important? It's because if I keep on believing a lie without seeking truth, the, my spiritual maturity will be hindered until I come to that truth. You know, when you hear something true and you say, oh, I see what you mean, I got it now. There is a liberation that takes place. It's the aha moment. It's the aha there moment. There is truth in your spirit. But in the, in, the, in the doctrinal issues, it takes time for that to come about. Right. It doesn't have, it's, we need to seek, to study the scriptures, to show ourselves approved Brilliant. unto God. So truth, therefore, is critically important. And if I'm going to grow in truth, I will be liberated from bondages spiritually, and I will come closer and closer to the reality of the dimension of the life that the Lord wants me to grow into. Now we come into a unity of the Spirit with Him. We are built up into a holy temple in the Lord, and each one of us is a living stone. Brent, Jared, Kyle, we're all living stones in there. We all have different responsibilities, but right. we are called, all of us, to grow in truth, you see. So there comes the unity of the Spirit. And that is the kind of unity is looking for this remnant that is preparing for the days to come. And the kind of lifestyle that will come along with that will fulfill one of the fours or all four of the priorities that God has because our lifestyle will be the same, growing into the unity of the faith 
and the knowledge of the Son of God and to a mature man. So we'll go back to that again. So our life will demonstrate to the Jew first, to the Jew first. We have done a lousy job in the church over the centuries because we have gone away from the foundation of the scriptures and right. followed uh, teachings that, you know, went away because made of... Made of man. Made of man, you know, the replacement theology. Exactly, that's what I was about to say, <laughs> is when the word is not your final authority, then you venture into dangerous doctrine, like, yes. like replacement theology. That's right. You know, but going back though, what you're saying is unity at all costs is not unity in the spirit. Absolutely It's the spirit not. of unity. It's a you know, spirit of unity. We've seen those who want a communist nation. We've seen those who want to slaughter newborns as they're born, right after they're born. We've seen those people tell us, let's come together and unify. But unity with evil is not possible for the sons and daughters of God. So we've got to put aside unity at all costs and seek the unity of the spirit, the unity of faith based on the word. That's right. And that's why it's all about him and us individually, the preparation. That's what John the Baptist came for. You know, if we look, if we look at, the, at the scripture, I'm going to read this part here. Turn in your phones, if you would. Turn into your Bible, your electronic <laughs> Bible. <laughs> oh, mamma mia, the technology today. Uh, it's really funny, you know. But anyway, let me read from you out of the scripture here. Um, this is out of Luke chapter 1. Uh, he, beginning with verse 14, you know, you will have joy and gladness and many rejoice at his birth. This is when the angel is speaking to Zacharias. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn the many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Mm -hmm. So here we have the word of preparing before the Lord returns, that his people, you and I, and Jared, and Kyle, and all these, uh, all these brothers and sisters that are right. watching us, who are already believers, we need to prepare ourselves for the return of the Lord. Now, there's so much to understand about this. Uh, I'll mention two things, two things. Number one, the verse I just read, is not the same as when God spoke to Malachi. I don't know if you paid attention to the words, but in the book of Malachi, in chapter 4, he says there... Coming to the spirit of Elijah. Yeah. Who will turn the hearts of the fathers of the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers. That's right. And so you're about to walk into the Elijah-John the Baptist connection, aren't you? Now, why... Why, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Why, now you just quoted exactly Malachi chapter uh -huh. 4. Uh -huh. Now listen to what the angel said, if you didn't pick it up earlier. He will come in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children. Right. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Did you ever notice that the angel did not quote Malachi? Wow. Wow. Say that last part again. It says, he will turn the hearts of the father to the children. Which we remember. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Wow. Why did he not? The why, why question again. Why? And I, when I came across this uh, uh, many years ago, I thought, Lord, why didn't you repeat the exact word? that the Holy Spirit gave to Malachi, why didn't you repeat the same word to John the Baptist? Good question. Yes. Did you get an answer? Oh, yes. Absolutely. You see. 
<laughs> it has to do with the two comings of the Messiah. It's critical to understand that because it's a cue, because remember, it's to prepare the way of the Lord, okay? Now, what was Elijah's main mission? To prepare the way when for the he Messiah. Was, yeah, he, Elijah was, you know, he was there, he was doing this incredible uh, demonstration of the power of God, right? And if Yahweh be God, serve him. And if, uh, if Baal be God, serve him. So here we have a prophet who is putting us at the foot, at the crossroad. You're either going to walk the way of God or you're going to walk your way, but make up your mind, okay? So it's a very serious thing. And, and, and the believers in those days knew because of Malachi that when John the Baptist came, when Elijah came, it was before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Right. Okay? So imagine this, what that did to their thinking. Because they didn't know there were going to be two comings. They believed when he arrived, right, that this was going to be the kingdom. And he would put all his enemies under his feet. That's, that's right. That's right. And, and so it's critical to, you know, to put ourselves in the mind of the believers of those days is really important to understand today. Why? Why? Because of some statements we hear all the time uh, on the part of Christians. You know, with, oh, we're in, we're in the last days. Yeah, they, they, that's what they said 100 years ago. That's what they said 500 years ago. Even the, the apostles believed they were in the last days. And then I rephrased the question. And I said, well, let me ask you this question then. Why did the Holy Spirit inspire the apostle to write that they were in the last days? Or did the apostle wrote the, write these things and they were not inspired when they said it? Is that a good question? It is. It's a very good question. So why did the Holy Spirit do that? You see, and it's, it's, I have four reasons for that, okay? I'll just give you one because it's, it's you know, timing and all. I think one of the most important one is so that because these fellows in those days really believed that the Messiah was about to come back, you know, at the end of their, uh, of their day, was it that this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel after he rose from the dead? Um, they really believe he was going to come back shortly. Right. And the Lord did not sp spare his words to make them believe differently. Okay? Let me put it this way. To them, it was going to be the, their last days because the nation of Israel ceased to exist okay? as a nation. 70 AD, no more Israel, right. renamed Palestine. We know that. Which Jesus foretold Which Jesus before foretold. it happened. The main reason, I think, uh, is so that we who live today in those last days would look at the scriptures and the way they thought, the way they reflected, the way they pondered over the world, the way they conducted their lives, was based on the fact they believed Yeshua was coming back soon. And therefore, looking at them and studying the scripture with that mindset in mind changes our understanding of how we are to live today. There are some verses that really make more sense when you look at it in the context of Jesus coming back shortly. And, and I don't want to go through them because it opens up different rabbit trails. But the importance of this, of the Holy Spirit inspiring the apostles mm. to write that they were in the last days, they behaved towards their understanding that Yeshua was coming back. And so today, the way they thought, the way they believed, the way they acted is to be our way. Now, to go back to John the Baptist and why did the Lord not inspire the Gabriel to say the same words. It's because of the two comings, you see. Because when he speaks the hearts of the fathers to the children, right. who are those fathers? The fathers of the faith. Right. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all of these guys that were there that, okay. that had, that, to whom was given the oracles of God. Those were the hearts of the fathers. 
which then the children are, of course, the children of God. So the hearts of the father needs to return to that. This is why John, this is why Elijah came and he called them back to the Torah because before the verses that are written, um, uh, send the father to the children and the children to the father. It says, remember the Torah of Moses. That's what it says. And so we see in the scriptures that the Jewish people, uh, they spoke to Paul in, in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 16, where he says, you see how many are zealous for the Torah? They were well, all zealous for the Torah. Now, and this is where the great discussion comes in because we're not under the law, but under grace, right? I mean, there's, there's so much to teach on. That's gonna be one of, that's gonna be probably my next book, um, Reconciling Law and Grace in the Life of the Believer, okay? Critical to understand. And, and there's a lot to say about that. We could spend a whole hour on it. Maybe not, but close, okay? Right. So, the, that's one of the parameters that we need to look at. The way um, the disciples walked is the way we are to walk. Now, and I know some of the people who are probably watching who are still in traditional Christianity go, oh, he's a Judaizer, you know. <laughs> no, exactly. It's critically important. We are not saved by works. We're not saved by following the law. I wrote the book on it. You know, behold. And, and speaking of that, as you, as you go on, this book, uh, because during these shows, your book has popped up that you have so graciously made available in the bookstore at GLC, which the bookstore is coming back, folks. Uh, what's the name of your new book? Oh, the, the book that I wrote this back uh, several years ago, it's called Behold, God is My Salvation. And, and I love the tagline. The tagline under that is, are you really saved or simply on probation? <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of a title like that before. <laughs> I love it. It, put, it, it goes, no, in that book, I defend through many, many perspectives the fact that once salvation is obtained according to the requirement of scriptures, it is eternal, okay? And I defend that left and right in the book through so many ways. Uh, salvation and marriage, salvation and circumcision, salvation and the covenant, salvation and all kinds of different things. Anyway. A deep book? So For I, deep thinkers, for oh those yeah, who ask why. A, I use over 400 scriptures wow. in the book. Wow. So anyway, the reason I say that right now is because I don't want people to think, oh yeah, we have to live by the law in order to be saved. No. We live, we, we live it because we want to walk as Jesus walked to begin with because he walked perfectly in love. Be Somebody said, I can't remember who, but I, that was a point, click, and save statement. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, he said, you know, Jesus loved perfectly because he walked the Torah perfectly. Okay. And he walked the Torah perfectly because he loved perfectly. Because you cannot, you see, I mean, that was a statement I point click and save. And, and, and there is a good reason for that because you heard me mention earlier, it will be based on love, but not at the expense of holiness or righteousness. Right. Because God is love, but God is holy. And he says, God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He doesn't say love, love, love is the Lord. Okay? Love is what's get, him, get us to him. But then we need to walk in his righteousness. Righteousness and justice is the foundation of my throne. That's what it says, right? He didn't say love right. and mercy is the foundation of his throne. And not everybody understands what holy means. Set apart. Set apart. Not everybody understands that righteousness is a right standing. Yes, yes, They yes. have this, this fear, which their perfect yeah. love cast at all fear, but they have this fear to be perfect, to be accepted by God. There's a difference being set apart, holy, and having a right standing. And yes. when you love somebody, you don't serve them out of obligation. You That's serve right. them because you love them. And you want you to know, please my them. My nature was changed because I love him. You know what I mean? And so I don't serve him out of obligation. No. You know, if there was no heaven and no hell, I would still serve him. 
for yeah. what he's already done for me, yeah. even though we know there is. You know, folks, what you're watching right now is true media. You're watching the truth. You're watching positive media that breathes life into these dry bones uh, that will come back to life again. And you're watching it on GLC. Some of you are seeing it on, on various cable channels. Uh, some of you are seeing it on Channel 15 in, in West Texas and beyond, YouTube. Uh, the list goes on, but this media is created to breathe life into you for days like these. How can you get behind it? Well, Kyle, show the graphic, if you would, on the screen. The best way to get, get behind this, in addition to your prayers, is with your buying power. You know, we can learn from people who do business with each other and support each other. You know, you don't have to support people who support the destruction of this country or the destruction of, of freedom. You can support those uh, who are for the truth and the light and for freedom. And you can get behind this in one way. is financially, raindrop. That's one to 30 bucks a month. That's one day of junk food, folks. Water bearer, 30 to 75 per month. And you are doing this and beyond. Operation, 75 to 150 per month, just to help with the operations. And growth, 150 or more per month. This is good soil, folks. And it's so wonderful to say that, you know, the days of desperation fundraising are over. Uh, that You don't see that on GLC. This is not a sinking ship. We're not rearranging furniture on the deck of the Titanic. We're sailing forward in momentum. And you are making it happen. You stepped up. You held the line. You're taking the territory. And there's momentum. You can see it for yourself. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So get behind positive, true, uncensored media. Turn off the lies and turn on the truth with GLC. Back to you, Jean-Claude. Yeah, so, so to, to finish up the story about yes. John the Baptist and why... I want to know. Okay, here is, here is why. It's because of the two comings. Because in, in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, what does it say there? It's speaking of the Lord, whom heaven must receive until the time of the restoration of all things right. that God has spoken through all his prophets since time began. Right. So there is a restoration of everything that was done in the past that God had revealed to his people. That is being restored today. And now the children, you and I, are called back to the fathers. So there is a dual prophecy a dual application to that prophecy in Malachi, which had to do with the first coming, having the fathers back, the hearts of the father back to the children, to restore the, the walking in righteousness that existed in the past. I mean, they had 400 years before Malachi, you know, since Malachi. But the reason he did not quote Malachi fully, the angel, was because the last part of the, of the verse applies to our day. We, the children of God, are being called to be restored to the faith of the Father, which is the faith that was once given to the saints. And there's a lot to say about this. Why? Because it lines up with the calendar of God. Absolutely. And you have a lot to say about the calendar of God. Oh, there's a lot God. to say about that because it, it, it's critical. Think about this. God, you know, we talked about it earlier. God knew before the foundation of the world everything was going to happen, guess what? He, he planned his redemption based on his foreknowledge of what was going to happen. He created the nation based on that. He sent the Messiah in the world be, be, on, on that. He planned his calendar based on that. And because he has control over times and dates and seasons and all, he made his feast, his appointed times which are demonstration of his wisdom, of his grace, of his power, the feast of the Lord. Why? Because not only did he design these to be a historical commemoration for Jewish people today of things that happened during the deliverance of Egypt, but each one of these eight celebration, and I say it, most people say seven, I say eight because of the Shemini Atzeres, which had another application, there are eight. Um, these were also, each one of them, were not only historical fulfillment, which can still be celebrated today, 
but each one of them was also prophetic of the first and the second coming of the Messiah. Wow. Each one of them. And so, and, the, and of course, Satan is, doesn't want that to happen because it points so beautifully to the incredible wisdom of God and his incredible power and his incredible grace. And so he is restoring that today. And it is the best witness we can give to Jewish people. The best witness. You see, remember he said to the Jew first, right? Right. When was the last time the church fulfilled that command? We didn't. Maybe on an individual basis, so to say, but today most Jewish people do not want the Messiah. I tell you what, brother, if I was an Orthodox Jew, I wouldn't want Jesus either. Why? Because that Jesus that is preached within Christianity is the true Messiah, don't get me wrong. He calls me to go away from the Torah. He calls me to deny the feast of the Lord that we're given. He calls me to go away from the Shabbat which God gave. He, this is a this is a Jesus that has that, that what Christianity has done, thanks to replacement theology and thanks to uh, several people throughout the centuries. It's a Jesus that that blends, or I should say, Christianity has has blended the holy and the profane. And most people don't know that. That's right. Most people don't know the origins of, of Easter or, or That's Christmas. Right. And, and in their hearts, you know, when they're singing Silent Night, they're singing to Jesus. When they're, when they're celebrating each other and, and, and his resurrection, they have no idea. And, 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 and I encourage people to look into that. I don't condemn uh, uh, people for, for not knowing, but you need no. to look into these things yourself because there's a misunderstanding there. Yes. There was a conglomeration of pagan religions to, to create a lot of the things that we have no idea about until we learn about them. And yeah. you know what? We are, we are to seek wisdom and we are to seek uh, the truth. But you're right. You know, uh, you talked about uh, uh, the attitude towards the, the, the Jews and, and how replacement theology has fed anti-Semitism that we see right now, and especially we see propagated in the media right now yeah. as well during this time where who would have thought that, that people in our leadership were actually funding terror towards Israel. And that's of course part of the strategy of Satan um, to uh, fulfill one of his four priorities, mm -hmm. you know, which are against the priorities of God. And so that's part of Satan's strategy. So this is why it is so important for individuals today, for believers that are already the elect, to really question who is their final authority. Is it going to be the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, the uh, Episcopal Church? Is it going to be any of the babies of that? Or is it going to be the final authorities, the scriptures? You see, is it what, is it, is it, what the foundation of the apostles and the prophets is, which we Gentile, I consider myself one of those former Gentiles, which we Gentiles are built upon. You see, the, the foundation of the apostles and the prophet was already ready when the gospel was sent finally to the Gentiles. And so they were, uh, the Gentiles were incorporated into the commonwealth of Israel and as such come under the jurisdiction of Israel, of the God of Israel. And that's why you are grafted into the olive tree, as well as being a member of the, a, a branch of the vine. And there's a lot to understand about that. But it all makes sense, logically. It all makes sense, not only logically, but biblically, you see. What was the intent of God in grafting us into the olive tree, this wild branch? Why? You see, so God, is in, God does not do anything without a purpose. Right. So, so these, these are some of the things that are really important because ultimately all doctrine is truth. And so if we refuse to seek truth, then we're going to uh, continually abide in a lie. And what will happen is this, instead of maturing as a living stone into, into this unity of the spirit in which we become more and more one with the Lord, and more and more of him in us. We won't do that. And I think, 
I, I may be wrong, but I think this is what Peter wrote when he said judgment will begin at the house of God because those who will not walk in truth, uh, and, and before, I, but before I say this, think about this. A, time, a great time of transition is coming. Mm -hmm. okay? In every transition, every drastic transition that took place in the past centuries, they were, each transition was always accompanied with very severe judgments. They always took place within a span of one generation. Wow. There were always a remnant that was prepared and kept through that to fulfill the purposes of God during those transitions. It's no different today because the transition, the, we, we believe that we are in a generation that will see the return of the Messiah. It will be accompanied by incredible judgments judgments and to repentance, you know, judgments and to discipline. Right. Uh, at the end, it'll be a judgment and to death in terms of, you know, the, after the tribulation period. But, but when we're looking, at, we're looking at God preparing a remnant today who must seek truth because the hour has come. I did, I, that he said, the hour is coming. I think it's here now, that hour where He's seeking those who worship him in spirit and in truth for the purpose of his fullness in the body of Messiah. He will fill all in all, you see. And those who will not seek after truth and walk in the truth and refuse, I think they'll just be taken home early. I will spit you out of my mouth. Isn't that what Yeshua said? If you're in the church of the They're not losing their salvation. It's just take them off because they're no longer the witness that he needs them to be. So, you know, to go back to your question that you opened this session with, what do we say to them? We answer the question when they ask us, but it's because they see a life in us that they recognize is different from the rest. And so during those trans this transition that is coming will be the greatest requirement on the part of the church because it will be global. It will have its inception in Israel, for certain. But there will be also the greatest, greatest harvest of souls during that time. I am fully convinced of that because it's during the times of persecution that people come to know the Lord. That's, that's when revival happens. That's when it takes place. And Satan hates that. It's not in his best interest. It's brother. not in his best interest. You know, interest. when you said that, it shot me. I thought, you know, I, I see all these moves to uh, suppress free speech and, and Christians and, and uh, uh, in, infringe upon all of our freedoms. And, and yet, when you, when you said that, it really got me thinking because we know, and we've been in different parts of the world where there is revival, where there is persecution. It's not in the enemy's best interest. Yet man is pushing this. Man is propagating this, yeah. but God is in control. He is in control. He moves the pieces. He laughs at the nations. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. And I'm so glad, man, that you have a heart. <sighs> for, and you have a heart for France. You know, you said something else too, Jean-Claude. And, and this has been an inspiring season for me, especially reuniting with you, my friend. You know, the every people group has a special gift. Yes. You believe that the people of France have a special has a gift. special a redemptive, redemptive gift. gift. What is that? Ah, oh boy. It is so incredible. The gift of love. Agape. Love. Agape. Not, He's oh, love. Oh. Yeah. Someone said that to you and he said, no, it has nothing to do with that. You know, it has to do with nothing to do with the sex and all that no. stuff. No, it has to do with you see, this is why it's so important to understand. France has a very special calling. Okay, I will, I will repeat again what, I, what we shared for dinner, at dinner time. I was in Florida uh, at a prayer conference, and one lady that was there said, Jean-Claude, I was in France for three years, and my role in France was to establish prayer groups in different cities, and I can't help but think that God cannot do something in the world until he has done something in France, a work in France. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting statement. Wow. Coming from a prayer, I pay attention to prayer people, okay? 
And then a few years later, I was in England at another prayer conference, and it was this time was a European prayer conference, and I got there just by one of those God incidents. I was not even invited. But anyway, there were 38 national leaders of prayer movements within their nation that had gathered in England to hear what God is saying to Europe, to the different nations. And I was the only French guy there, and the, there was a lady representing France. She was British, who lived in France. So when they found out I was French, they said, do you have anything to share? And I said, yeah. So I shared, and when I got through finishing sharing what I had to share, uh, two guys came to me from different nations, separate one from the other. Okay? They came at two different times. And one of them said, Jean-Claude, you know what you said, we also need, but I believe there are some things that God cannot do in Europe until he has done the work in France. Wow. And I was the second witness, and the third witness said the same thing. So here is why I believe the redemptive gift of God for France is love. Um, it's, it, it's really something else. It has to do with what Satan does to counteract the work of God. Satan either counteracts the work of God, right. uses it as it is, or twists it for his own use. Okay? Right. When it comes to France, he counteracts it. Because as we mentioned earlier, true love engenders a profound confidence and perfect freedom. Okay? So because of this desire for freedom, the French are mostly atheistic and secular humanist. They don't a want anything to do. counterfeit of the ultimate freedom. That's right. And, and so they, they don't want anything to do with God because they equate him with religion. Okay? So Satan has to compensate for that, for that inner desire for the French to be free. Uh, think about this. Our motto in France, the first, the first line of our motto, liberty. The second line, equality. The third line, Liberté, égalité, fraternité, brotherhood. Liberty, equality, and brotherhood. That's the expression of love. And that's our motto in France. Think about it. Wow. So, and there's a lot to say about that. But this is what the French motto is. It, it's, the, it's an expression of what love is. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so Satan wants to hinder the power of God in there. And so he gives the French atheism. I was a perfect example of that because I'm free. I don't have to submit to anybody. You see what I mean? I don't have to submit. So the redemptive gift of God. And France is going to go through the worst thing ever. Um, we ran out of time, but the France is going to go through the worst thing ever. Right now, there is a, there is a president that's supposed to be reelected. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do everything I can in my little corner here to to help that it's not going to happen. France needs to redo their, their platform for po the political platform. You know what's interesting? They quote the separation of powers, right? In right. France too. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. But they have no clue it comes out of the book of Isaiah. <laughs> Chapter 20, <laughs> 32, verse 22. You know, 33, verse 22. It doesn't, it, they have no idea it comes out of the Bible. You see, and many of the things they believe comes out of the Bible that just don't know the Bible. So it's an advantage, okay? But they need to, they need to present for the next president, the, the, whoever is going to be, they need to have a revamping of the platform on which the government exists. It, it's, it's critical. And there's a lot to say France about this. France needs our prayers. Yeah, they need, they need prayers. So pray for the French people. Because what we need to do there, and, and my desire for the French, my desire is to do everything I can so they return to the foundation of the Judeo-Christian foundation of the faith. Returning to Yeshua, returning to Jesus, and to the scriptures as their final authority. That's what I want to do. And so we'll see. We'll see how that happens. But I believe it's going to happen because it's got redemptive gift. And the French is a, is a thinker, okay? Yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot to say about all of this, but we're running out of time and you need to close. Thank you so much, I brother. I love what you've got, brother. Thank you, brother. We love you, and, and you know, you are, you are a thinker and a Let's seeker. Let's for France. We will. And, and you know, to the thinkers out there. Uh, 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 just let me finish. Just yeah. this one statement. The, this 
redemptive purpose will be manifest on the plate of runes. Okay. Yes, sir. It'll be there on the plate of runes. Heavy, strong, truth. For you thinkers, the Lord calls to you. Um, I'll never forget talking to a guy that he was, he was all about the logic and all about the thinking, and that's good. I took him at Psalm 22, written a thousand years before it happened. How they have pierced my hands and they've pierced my feet. They've cast lots for my garment. You know, uh, seek him and you will find him. The Bible is true. The Bible is history. It's humanly impossible, scientifically impossible. It's, but it's true. It's come to pass and it continues to come to pass. And the God of the Bible calls to you. Call to me and I will answer you. Seek me and you will find me. And those of you who are confused and you're not sure what to do, or maybe you're afraid, maybe you're floundering in your life, Jesus, uh, his life in you and knowing him and loving him and following him, it not only activates your destiny, but most importantly, it saves your soul, brings you into that right standing, that righteousness with him. Uh, it makes you holy, truly set apart, not conformed to the pattern of this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind and the washing of the word. And what is that, Jean-Claude? That's your final authority, which is the Lord and his, and his word spoken through his word. Crack open that Bible, folks. Your story yes. is in there. You know, when David said, my, my days were written in your book before I was born, it wasn't just poetry, folks. He knows your days. He knew you before you were knit together in your mother's womb. He loves you. And you are the culmination of all the generations of your ancestors. Uh, the blood in your veins has been around for a long time, passed down from father to son parent to parent, and I pray that the dreams and the aspirations that is meant for your time and for your generation, that you step into that, that you take your place in history, and you take your place in the kingdom, and that you know the truth, and you walk in the light. Everyone else, we encourage you, join us today as that graphic goes up before we close, Kyle, and get behind the work, get behind uh, the front line, fighting the prince of the air with positive media, the raindrop, the water bearer, the operations, the growth. Bypass it all, folks. You know, you, you, where your treasure is, there your heart is also, right? And so put your treasure in places where it will grow and where it will flourish. Elon Musk says it's Bitcoin. Jean-Claude and I say it's, it's the work of the kingdom. <laughs> you be the judge. But get behind the work of GLC. And Jean-Claude, you've got more shows coming too. Jamie Berryhill of Mission Messiah, MMTV. His show is on here too. You've seen Jamie hosting some of the light of the Southwest. He's going to go into even more depth. We just touched the tip of the iceberg, Jean-Claude. And I'm so happy to be reunited. So happy to see you folks. Thanks for watching GLC. God bless you and keep you. We'll talk to you next time. We'll see you next time on Light of the Southwest. <music>